This is the first in a series of readings from the psychological commentaries on the teachings of Gurdjieff and Auspinsky by Maurice Nicole. Book One, Forward. These commentaries were written on the teaching which Dr. Maurice Nicole received personally from Auspinsky, whom he met in 1921, and Gurdjieff, whom he met in 1922. He studied under Auspinsky and then, in 1922, went to Gurdjieff's Institute at Fontainebleau for a year, after which he returned to London and studied under Auspinsky. Until 1931, when Auspinsky gave him permission to teach the system. Dr. Nicole's teaching has continued from 1931 until the present day. The commentaries which form this book were begun during the war years and continued afterwards. March 27, 1941 Dear Bush, I was very interested to have your report of the meeting on March 20th. I think it would be best if I wrote to you on the basis of the questions that you have reported to me and the personal notes that you made yourself. In the first place, what must be understood is that man on this earth is in a very strange situation. When I first heard about this idea of man, it affected me very much. Ordinarily, of course, we imagine that man can grow and develop in what I might call the natural, normal way, simply by education, example, and so on. Yet, if we look at history, we find that man has not really developed. And particularly, if we look at the present day, we cannot boast that man has reached any real further stage of development. Look for a moment at the horrors that humanity imposes on itself nowadays. Yet people are prone to imagine that time means progress and that everything is getting better and better as time passes. And as a rule, people take the obvious contradictions as exceptional. That is to say, people are always inclined to think that what are really the usual and ever-present circumstances of life, in a bad sense, are exceptional. You will agree with me, perhaps, that people usually regard war as exceptional. Yet, you must admit that if you pick up any book of history, you will find that it deals with war in the main, with war, intrigue, people seeking power, and so on. Actually, unless we have the strength of mind to see what ordinary life on this planet is like, we will remain in imagination or illusion, if you prefer the word. As you know, in this system of work, amongst many sayings which have a great density of meaning, namely, that take a long time to understand, there is one saying that the level of being of a man attracts his life. This saying applies to humanity in general, that is, the general level of humanity with regard to its being attracts the form of life that it experiences. It is useless to think that wars and horrors and revolutions, etc., are exceptional. What is at fault is the level of being of people. But nobody is willing to understand this, and whenever war takes place, as I said, People take it as exceptional and even speak about a future free from war as soon as the existing war is over. We can see the same process at work now. History repeats itself because man remains at the same level of being. Namely, he attracts again and again the same circumstances, feels the same things, says the same things, hopes the same things, believes the same things. And yet, nothing actually changes. All the articles that were written in the last war are just the same as the articles written in this war and will be forever and ever. But what concerns us more is that the same idea applies to ourselves, to each individual person. As long as there is no change in the level of being, the personal history of a man remains the same. Everything repeats itself in his own life. He says the same things. He does the same things. He regrets the same things. He commits the same things. And all this belongs to this immensely deep idea that the level of being attracts his life. 
Let us come to some of the main ideas which deal with the question of how a man can change his being. The whole of this work is about a change of being, that is, a change of the level of being at which a man naturally is in ordinary life. What must be first realized here is that every one of us is at a certain level of being. In this connection, we must visualize a vertical direction or a ladder extending, as it were, from below upwards and having many rungs on it. People, all of us, are on one or another of the rungs of this ladder that stands vertically below and above us. This ladder is quite different from time, namely from past, present, and future, which we can imagine as a horizontal line. In order to make my meaning clearer, I would like to ask you how you imagine time, that is, the passage of time from the past into the present and into the future. Usually, the kind of mechanical hope that people hold on to is connected with the idea of time, namely that in the future things will be better, or they themselves will be better, and so on. But this ladder of which we are speaking, and which refers to different levels of being, has nothing to do with time in this sense. A higher level of being lies immediately above all of us at this very moment. It does not lie in the future of time, but in ourselves at this very moment, now. All work on oneself, all personal work which deals with stopping negative emotions, with self-remembering, with not being identified with one's woes and troubles, with not making accounts, etc., etc., is concerned with a certain action that can take place in oneself at this moment, now, if one tries to be more conscious and remembers what it is we are trying to do in this work. That is to say, the work is about a certain transformation of the instant, of the moment, of the present, through the action of this work. For example, a man finding himself in the depths of despair, if he observes the situation and tries to remember himself or tries to give himself any other kind of conscious shock at that particular moment, such as remembering his aim, that is, in other words, if he tries to transform himself, to transform his mechanical reaction to the circumstances that surround him at that moment, he may find to his astonishment that quite suddenly everything is changed. His mood of depression vanishes, and he finds himself in a new atmosphere from which he wonders how he could have been in his former state. This represents a momentary change in the level of being because everything has not an exact level of being, but a general, average level of being in which there are higher and lower degrees. But here we are talking about the application of the work to change in regard to the level of being. We are talking about what I might call the third stage of a man, and now I will explain what I mean by this. As was said, a man is born as essence, and this constitutes his real part, the part from which he can really grow and develop. But this part in him can only grow in a very small way. It has not the strength to grow by itself any further after, say, the age of three or four or five. Let us call this the first stage of a man. That is, the first stage of a man is pure essence, which by itself is capable of a certain amount of growth, but reaches a point very soon in which it can grow no further. I notice in some of the questions asked in your letter to me that this point about man has not been understood, so I am going to repeat it again. As I said, this system teaches that the essence in a man can only grow a very short way by itself. You have to try to see what I mean. People naturally think that growth and development is something continuous, or that it should be. But here is this extraordinarily interesting idea taught by this system that this is not the case. Man's essence can only grow by itself unaided to a very small extent, and as such a man is nothing but a little child. Now, in order for it to grow further, something must happen. Something must form itself 
round essence, and this is called personality. Essence must become surrounded by something that is really foreign to itself, acquired from life, which enters through the senses. A little child must cease to be itself and become something different from itself. As you were told, the center of gravity of itself begins to pass from essence into personality. It learns all sorts of things, it imitates all sorts of things, and so on. This formation of personality around essence, which is necessary for the development of essence, can be called the second stage of man. But let us clearly understand what is meant here. The future development of essence depends on the formation of personality around it. If a very poor personality, a very weak personality, is formed round it, there is very little to help further growth of essence, which we will speak of when we come to the third stage. In the second stage, the formation of personality is taking place, and as was said, the richer the personality, the better. But I notice that some of you do not understand what is meant here. The reason why you do not understand what is meant here is because you do not see this extraordinary situation that man is in. Namely, that man cannot grow continuously from essence because essence is too weak to grow by itself. The further growth of essence depends first of all on the formation of personality and the richer the personality, the better eventually for the growth of essence. But ordinarily speaking, the formation of personality is quite sufficient for the purposes of life. A man finds himself in a good position, able to deal with life through the formation of a rich personality in him. And if he is satisfied, he is, for all life purposes, adequate. But this work, this teaching, is about a further stage of man. And this stage I will call the third stage. You must understand that this work is not really about life. It is about something else that a man can begin to attempt quite apart from whether he is a successful politician, a famous scientist, or a well-respected butcher, or baker, or candlestick maker. This work starts from man as good householder, namely from a man who has developed personality and can deal with life in his own particular way, reasonably enough. That is to say, it starts from the level of good householder, which belongs to the second stage of a man's development. This third stage is all concerned with a possible further development of essence, and that is why so many apparently paradoxical, or at least strange things are said in the Gospels, such as are contained in the Sermon on the Mount about man. They are all to do with allowing essence to grow at the expense of personality. And this is the only way in which essence, which is too weak by itself to grow, can continue to develop. In this sense, personality, which is formed around essence, and must be formed around essence, becomes eventually, if this third stage is entered upon, the very source from which essence can grow further. Let us suppose that personality is in a particular person very richly developed. He is then a rich man in the sense of the Gospels. He knows about everything. He is an important person and so on. What is poor in him? What is poor in him is his essence. He is not yet a real man. What he does he does to acquire merit, or from fear of loss of honor or reputation and so on. But he does nothing from himself, nothing from the love of doing it, quite apart from praise, authority, position, popularity, or any other gain in the eyes of the world. Suppose that this man feels in some way like the prodigal son, namely that he is eating nothing but husks. I mean simply that he may feel in himself very empty in spite of all his richness. He has got the finest house or jewels. He has got a well-known name. He has in some way got the better of everybody else, and yet he feels empty. Such a man is approaching the third 
possible stage of development. He has now reached a position in which his essence, namely his real part, can grow and thus replace his feeling of emptiness by a feeling of meaning. But in order to bring about in man this further development, he must begin, as it were, to sacrifice his personality and to go in a sense in the opposite direction to that in which he has gone up to now. In other words, a kind of reversal must take place in him, which is well expressed in the parable of the prodigal son. And unless we understand that this third stage is possible and leads to a man's real development, we will never understand what the Gospels are speaking about or what this system is speaking about. The other day at a meeting here, the following lines were read. Let us take the Sermon on the Mount and try to understand what it means. As was said before in the last talk, religion, as it is called, that is, as the psychological ideas taught by Christ about the individual evolution of man and his transformation into a new man, are usually called, is concerned with the development of essence after personality has been formed. A man in whom a rich personality has been formed by experience, education, and interests is a rich man in personality. But essence remains poor. For it to develop, personality must become passive. This was not understood, but it is very important that everyone in the work should understand what this paragraph means. It means that religion, in the real sense, and we only know Christianity ourselves, refers to the third stage of a man, the making of personality passive so that essence can grow. I must repeat again that the inner meaning of the Gospels has nothing to do with life. Their teaching starts at the point where personality has been formed already in a man and refers to this third stage of possible development. A man must first of all become developed as regards personality by the action of life. This work is sometimes called a second education. It is for those who are looking for a second education. The first education is an education that life gives us, and this is absolutely necessary. The better a person is educated by means of life, the more he learns, the more intelligent he is, the more experienced he is, the more he knows about people and about affairs, the more he knows about manners, the better he can express himself. The more he is able to use the different sides of life, the better for him. This is the first education. This forms personality. We have said before, that man consists of different centers, and each of these has different parts. These centers and parts should be well furnished, and the better furnished they are with inscriptions on rolls, the better for him. But a point comes in a man's development where, as was said before, he feels empty, and it is at this stage that the teaching of the Gospels and all this work comes in. I do not know whether any of you have ever thought about this very deeply, but it is quite possible that some of you who have done your duty in life often wonder what it is exactly you are doing, what the meaning of it all is. Speaking in this personal way for a moment, I would like to ask you this question. Do you think that life and the meanings that it affords us are enough and have you felt that in some way life does not quite give you what you expected? I am not saying that life is meaningless. It has obviously many meanings. But have any of you come to the point of feeling a certain meaninglessness, even in those interests that you follow and try to hold on to? Why am I saying this? Is because if life afforded us our full meaning, then there would be no point, in fact, no meaning, either in what the Gospels talk about or in what this system talks about. If you are quite content with the meanings that life affords, quite self-satisfied, then there is no point in trying to understand what this system teaches. And let me add, there is no point in your trying to understand what Christ's teaching really means. Now, 
if man were nothing but a well-formed personality and this were his end, then we might very well believe in all those doctrines of humanitarianism and other scientific ideas that say that man is nothing but a creature turned towards external life and having to adapt himself as intelligently as possible towards it. But if you have followed what has been said in this letter about the idea of man in this system, you will see that the development of personality is merely a stage and an absolutely necessary stage towards a further stage. It is directly comparable with the formation of a mass of food round a seed, as in the case of a nut. The nut has an essential part in it, namely the seed itself that can grow. But it cannot grow until it is surrounded by a mass of nourishing material, just as an egg has a seed in it surrounded by a mass of yolk, and so on. Take the latter example. How can a chicken grow unless it has all the substances surrounding it for it to feed on. And remember that it grows inside the eggshell and finally emerges a complete chicken. And this complete chicken has been made out of the substances that the living germ has attacked and eaten. Now, the fate of acorns is one thing, but the fate of oak trees is a different thing. And as was said, man surrounded by personality resembles an acorn and suffers as it were the same fate as the acorn, unless he begins to grow. And growth in a man corresponds to what we are calling the third stage in a man, after personality has been formed round essence. If we take man at this second stage, where essence is surrounded by personality, he is just like an acorn, maybe a larger or a smaller acorn, but nothing but an acorn. He is perhaps very important. He has learnt many things. He feels he knows. He is, in short, full of personality. And that is his level. And at that level, he suffers, not really a proper human fate, but the fate of an undeveloped organism, the fate of a person who is not yet fully grown, just as an acorn is not a fully grown tree. And unless we understand very clearly about this third stage, namely the development of an acorn into a tree by its living essence or seed feeding on the substances formed round it, we shall never understand, as I said before, what this work is about, nor shall we understand what the Gospels are about. You have already heard that man is a self-developing organism and is created as such. But now you can see that his development is not continuous. It must be interrupted by the formation of personality. I would be very glad if you all can understand this question of essence and personality up to this point. Later on, we will talk about what it means to develop essence at the expense of personality in more detail. But already you know a few points about this development. But let me ask you once more before I end this letter. Have any of you ever thought what the Sermon on the Mount means? Do you seriously mix it up with the second stage of man's development, or have you already got some sense of scale? Do you not understand that the Sermon of the Mount, about being humble and so on, has nothing to do with ordinary life, but applies to this third stage of a man when he comes to the point of feeling empty, since personality does not satisfy him and he wishes to find new meaning for his own existence. I will try later on to write to you in more detail. I hope now that you understood what I called at the beginning of this letter the extraordinary situation of man on this earth in regard to his development. He is born with essence, and that is real and is the living germ in him, but it can only develop by itself to a very small extent. Personality must then form itself around essence, and essence has no chance to grow further unless this personality forms itself around essence. But if a man remains in that state, which we have called the second stage, namely in which personality is now active in him, he is not yet a man and is comparable with an acorn or a seed that has formed around itself nourishment for its eventual development. The third stage of a man is when he comes to make his personality passive so that the essence in him can grow. And there are, as it were, three forms of teaching that a man meets 
within consequence. As Essence, as a little baby, he hears simple ideas from his mother, and as we shall see later, these simple ideas are important. Then he passes into life and learns the opinions of the period of the world he happens to be born into. This is his second stage. In this stage, he takes up memory systems, correspondence courses, passes examinations, and so on. Personality is being formed. But there exists in this world a very strange class of teachings, one of which is clearly exemplified in the Gospels. What is their place? What are they about? They belong to the third stage of a man's development to the new growth of essence that can now take place at the expense of personality. Unless we grasp this, we cannot understand either this system or the Gospels. They belong to this third stage which is defined by Christ when he says to the rich man, Go sell that thou hast and give to the poor. And we must remember that the poor in us is this poor development of essence. And the rich man is personality. Now, you perhaps understand better what the phrase in this work means, which says that man is unfinished or incomplete. He is unfinished exactly as an acorn is unfinished. At the second stage, when personality has formed itself round him, he is incomplete just like an acorn and in an exactly similar sense. If you have understood something of what all this means, you will be in a much better position for me to talk about what false personality means and will be able to understand what it means to try to go against false personality. And now I wish to add one more word, even at the risk of your feeling that I am repeating myself too much. Do you really begin to understand some of the implications of this idea about essence and personality? Can you begin to see what it means? What does it mean? No matter what form of education you have in life, what political color you belong to, it can only form personality in a man. You may arrange for the best possible teaching of science, economics, history, literature, etc., but it will only form in a man personality. It cannot lead him to his real eventual development. And so perhaps now you understand more clearly why there exist in life two kinds of influences acting on a man, as all you older people in the work remember. One kind of influences are called A influences. These are created by life, and they are forms of education that belong to the period that we are brought up in. All the viewpoints that belong to the particular age in which a man is born. These are A influences and form personality in him. But there are also, as we can see for ourselves even today, other influences which are ageless. For us, the Gospels and their teaching are the chief example. These, as you know, are in this system called B influences, and these hold good for any age because they are always about the same thing, namely, this third stage of development of a man in which essence begins to grow at the expense of personality. Unless we really understand this apparent paradox, we will never get a very clear idea of the place of this system. It begins at the end of the second stage when personality has been formed and a man has tasted life and seen what things are like and feels dissatisfied and begins to seek for something additional for something that will make him understand better, something that will help him and give him a direction and eventually complete him. Yours, Maurice Nicole.